So are you making this mistake with compressors? Let's talk about a few different mistakes that people commonly make with compressors, or maybe some things they may not understand. Sometimes it's completely misunderstood as to what actually a compressor is going to do to the sound. Sometimes people will say that when it's on, they can't hear a difference. So let's go through a few of these different mistakes that people sort of make every now and then and uh, try to clarify just a little bit. Now I have two different Eagle compressors set up here. This type of compression circuit is based off of, uh, it's kind of loosely based around like a, a Dynacomp style compressor. So like the Keeley four knob compressors based off the same type of circuit. There's a million different types of, that's the most popular one I can think of. There's a bunch of different types of compressors that are based off this same type of circuit. So as you can see here, I have a compressor going into a Bell overdrive, then going back into another compressor I'll come back around to why this is relevant here in just a minute. But first of all, um, you'll see the settings are pretty exaggerated. I have the sustain knob all the way up. I have the attack all the way down. So as quick of attack as I can get with this style circuit. A blend is all the way up, so no blend on it. No clean signal blend there. So I'm going to play a part that's uh, a little bit staccato, a little soft part, and then some ringing chords. Not because it's a great sound to you, but it's because it's a good demonstration of what a compressor is going to do to these things. So let me show you with these exaggerated settings on the compressor. First, without the compressor. <laughs> Try it with the compressor on. You can hear it squashes that way down. And whenever I play a note just a little bit, it's fairly even right there, except when I play really loud, whenever I have a lot of dynamics. You can see how that squashes way, way down. And then whenever my notes ring out. You notice how it brought that soft that soft passage there. It brought that up to a level. It compressed it up, so it's compressing down and it's also compressing up. With this particular type of control, you don't always want that much compression if you're using a, a pedal that doesn't really have a clean blend on it. Sometimes it's just too much. So that's the second mistake. Sometimes it does this too much compression and it is totally killing your dynamics. And therefore everything you play just sounds about this big. If you have a compressor that doesn't have a blend, you'll want to adjust that sustain or it, there's a million different names that you can put on that type of control. Uh, but you want to adjust that down so it's not killing that top spike so much, that, that volume spike right there. And you will have to adjust other controls as well. So in this situation, we're going to adjust the volume to kind of compensate for that. So what you're basically seeing here is that that 
that spike in the dynamics, when I'm hitting it really hard, it is still compressing it down somewhat, not as much. And the upward compression is, it, it's not pushing it up as much, still a little bit, but not as much. The attack control, let's turn the sustain all the way back up because it's gonna exaggerate some of these settings and you'll be able to hear them a little bit better. So let's, let's mess with that just for a minute. Notice that splatty, that I don't really, I guess that's how I would explain it. The you can hear that just that weird attack on the note. That's because of that slow attack there. You turn the attack all the way down, volume to compensate. It still does it a bit because it is an, uh, a 3080 type of compressor but it's not going to do the exact same thing. Sometimes you do want that, especially in like older country stuff. kind of gives you that sort of chicken picking sort of thing there. It kind of helps with it anyways. Without a compressor, you can still do it. It's just, uh, it's not as compressed. All right, so now let's go back to this. We can take the blend and actually blend in some clean signal and uh, get some of our dynamics back while still retaining some of the compression. I'm gonna turn the attack all the way down because I like it faster on a guitar. And then another common complaint with compressors is noise. So yes, compressors, every compressor, no matter what type, no matter what brand, depending on how much compression it can give you, it's going to give you noise. Um, basically, as you're compressing, you're compressing everything. So you're, you're not, not only are you shoving that volume down, almost like someone is writing the volume knob is kind of what a compressor does. Not only are you shoving that volume down, you're lifting it up, and with that, if there's any amount of noise in it, you're going to also increase that noise. It's just the way compressors work, it's the way gain works. The more, no if any amount of noise that you have in your signal, if you add gain to it, add volume to it, you're going to hear more of that noise. There's things you can do you can, to eliminate it, I mean, circuit-wise, but at the end of the day, it's still a gain type of circuit and it's still gonna add some amount of noise. Especially if you have like an overdrive or distortion, it's going to increase that noise as well. Because as we know, any amount of gain increases noise. So by adding an overdrive or distortion, you're going to increase the noise. Compression before or after a drive pedal or an amp ch channel that's distorting, whatever, uh, they both kind of work similar in that. If you compress before it, it's different than if you compress after it. I'll show you what I mean. So as you can see, volumes are the same, knobs are pretty much the same. Add a little more sustain there. So let's try it before. First, let me kick on the overdrive, turn on the compressor before and after. <laughs> So 
So what's happening here? But when you have the compression before, those peaks and those, those hills and valleys, so to speak, of that sine wave, of, of the signal, um, it's, it's raising that lowest part and it's squashing that, that highest part, right? So it's a little bit more of a consistent signal that ends up getting clipped, ends up getting distorted more before it. Now, when you put it after, it's taking that distorted signal, that already distorted signal, so that so it's by distortion, by definition of, of the clipping, you're kind of clipping those peaks already to create that distortion sound. So it doesn't, it doesn't really overdrive it anymore. You're just taking that distorted signal and then just compressing that further rather than compressing the signal and then distorting it even more or, or clipping it further, which creates the distortion. So to answer the question where to put it, that's completely your opinion, completely up to you. Sometimes I like it before, other times I like it after, sometimes I use it both, especially like in a recording scenario. A lot of, a lot of your favorite recordings have compression on the guitar after it's already been distorted, after it's already done everything, they're compressing it there. Other times they're also adding compression when the signal comes in. So it's already distorted, but it's coming in maybe doing some other stuff there, maybe adding some width and some EQ and some other things. And then it could be compressed after that as well. There's, there's a million ways to uh, really mix and master recordings and there's not really one, one true way. So ultimately it's completely up to you which one you like. Sorry, there's no real answer for you, but that is the truth. So I hope you liked this video, hope it helped you and we'll see you next time with another video.